Uh, we're going to be getting into the depths of net zero. Uh, but I'm going to start off with some introductions. So uh, my name is Andrew Griffiths. I'm from Planet Mark. Uh, we certify organizations, particularly in the UK, but around the world for uh, reduction of carbon emissions and the creation of social value. And uh, we've got a fantastic panel who I'm going to allow to introduce themselves because I couldn't possibly do it justice. So I'm going to pass it first to, to Julie just here. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, I'm Julie Gonzalez. I'm the CMO at Climeworks. And what we do is direct a capture, right? So filtering CO2 out of the air in order to store it and removing it permanently um, from the atmosphere. So very excited to be here to talk about this journey together. And now handing over to Lubomila. Thank you so much. My name is Lubomila, CEO and co-founder of Plan A. We're a software as a service platform for decarbonization of corporates. So against the targets that businesses set for themselves, we give them a prescriptive journey of how much is it going to cost them, how long is it going to take, who do they need to involve on this journey, and make it a lot more practical uh, beyond just the headlines that we've been hearing a lot these days. The usual type of clients that we work with are big automotive like BMW, big financial institutions like BNP Paribas, but also fashion companies like Chloe. Um, I'm so excited to be speaking here with... Uh, I have so much uh, uh, to learn from everyone that is here, but I think all of us can bring a lot to the table of how this can tangibly happen. Great, thank you so much. I'm Christina Cloberdance, Chief Sustainability Officer at Macquarie Asset Management, and we're a global asset management company, and if you're not familiar, the world's largest infrastructure asset manager, ports and airports and toll roads and data centers, over 500 million people use our portfolio assets every day without knowing it. Five million hectares of, of farmland and we have the Green Investment Group. So a portfolio that has a lot of opportunity. Amazing. So we're going to be kicking off, we're going to be talking about net zero. So very briefly, uh, we have what we like to call the 90-10 principle within net zero, i.e. the emphasis is very much upon reductions, right? We have to achieve 90% reductions across all three scopes of emission uh, and only the last up to 10% is what we talk about carbon removal offsets for, right? So 90% 90, 90 to 10%. So we're gonna start by talking about the 90%. That's where the meat, and, uh, you know, the meat really is in terms of, and, and a lot of the challenges are. So um, I'm gonna to turn to Lubomila first of all. So how can organizations set out to achieve the 90% reduction in emissions? And, and what does a good net zero governance framework look like? In Plan A, we follow the principle of uh, three steps within this whole process. The first one is measure. It is uh, an obvious but incredibly important step where businesses spend time on continuously observing the performance of their um, environmental um, essentially impact on the planet. What this means is that they need to look at their value chain. They need to understand what are the biggest levers for improvement. The second one that often gets to be ignored, but as we were speaking earlier, is the one that um, actually holds the key to success in decarbonization is educate. Um, the truth is, is that there's a lot of discrepancy still in organizations across the different stakeholders. Um, and the knowledge that the sustainability or the impact or ESG team has often is not the same as all the other stakeholders within the company. By educating the people within your own organization, but also your uh, stakeholders like suppliers, uh, you stand a better chance of decarbonizing. And then the final bit, which is now becoming a lot more prominent, is collaborate. Um, the idea that you've calculated your emissions also on scope three, looking into your supply chain, your transportation, logistics, investments, is fantastic. But the only way you can actually achieve net zero, if you take, for example, a company that is like BMW that has 70 to 80% of its emissions within scope three, you can only achieve that by kicking off this process now and collaborating with your stakeholders to understand the biggest challenges that they face in this process. Amazing, thanks. So measure, educate, collaborate. I like it, it's catchy. Um, so, all right, so we'll, and we'll, we'll dig more into the sort of how we achieve those reductions in a bit, but briefly to turn across to the 10%. So the carbon removal piece, right? So what are the portfolio of solutions that we need to use to achieve uh, the, the carbon removals for that 10% and, and what role does technology play in that? Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's very important to really focus on saying that's 10% and the ambition of everyone here should be that it stays at 10%, right? That it comes as a second but necessary step after the reduction 
right, that Lubomila was, was talking about. Um, the second thing is how is this only achievable through a portfolio of carbon removal solution, right? So it's not a silver bullet and no solution is a silver bullet within that. And when you talk about a portfolio, it's really about having a ranges of solutions that range from nature-based solutions, so reforestation, afforestation, um, forest management, right, done well, hybrid solution like BEX, and then pure technology solution like, like, like Director Capture are really needed, right? And they all have a part to play. Um, I think what we advocate for, so our vision at Climeworks is to inspire one billion people to remove CO2 from the air um, because we need to get to that step. If, if you have a net zero strategy, you basically said yes to removal because we already know there will be some um, uh, left after you made this incredible effort of, of reducing the emission. So we need that portfolio of solution and there is a role to play for everyone. And we really encourage everyone to have a set of standard to hold you know, every type of solution accountable for benefits um, that might be different, right? From biodiversity to um, land effectiveness, for instance, or permanence of solution, um, storage solution. So there, are, there is space uh, for everyone, I would say, unfortunately, right? Because the challenge that we left at is, is so big. And the second um, or the third thing I want to say that this industry doesn't exist yet, right? Like the volumes and the magnitude in which we need um, the 10%, although it sounds like a small number, right? But it's, it's, it's a very long journey to go to. We're talking 310 billion tons of to be removed, accumulated by, you know, um, 2,000 and, and 100. Um, so there's still a long way to go, and that's exactly where Climeworks is, right? Like high scrutiny, high quality standard at the beginning of the journey, but the need to scale up. And that's where um, you know, we need all forces to come together, the voluntary carbon market, um, the, then the compliance, let's say the verification and the reporting standards, but then also the financing side to come together. Thank you. So, and you mentioned carbon markets, and so all of this is gonna cost money. Uh, you know, how do we, you know, and so Christina, um, you know, how, how do we finance the massive investments that we need in both the sort of emission reductions and the carbon removal technologies? What, what's the role of the carbon markets and the financial industry is going to play in that? Yeah, well, first I will say there is not one solution. It's, it's going to take... Um, it's going to take a multitude of, of different pathways to, to finance. Um, I'll just talk specifically from what we're doing at um, Macquarie to give a little bit of an example. Uh, 2017, we acquired the Green Investment Bank. Um, we did that and we were able to invest in, sun, in, in uh, wind, solar, um, offshore, and we were doing that from our balance sheet. As those type of solutions became more mature, what we did is we just brought the Green Investment Group into our asset management part of the business this April. And what that did is it gives us the opportunity to go out and get fiduciary um, capital and fundraising so that we can do more. Now we're able to do the same type of things with um, um, additional emerging technologies and whether it's battery or whether it's EV or whether it's hydrogen and you start to look at different models where you can fund and finance. I'll give you another example on our infrastructure um, assets and our real assets portfolio we have 170 portfolio companies um, and like I mentioned these are airports and roads and toll roads um, data centers. We actually put an aggressive target out there. We were the first asset manager, global asset manager, to commit to net zero by 2040. Um, and that means with our portfolio companies as well. So we actually have a goal of having all of those portfolio companies with net zero board approved plans in place by the end of the year. And here's where I'm gonna open um, things up and say, will we make that by the end of the year? That is an aggressive, it, it is hard. When Lubin Miller talked about working with corporates on developing those plans, it's hard. We're not gonna get to 100%, but I'm actually thrilled to death with the percentage that we will get to. Will that be 60, will it be 70, will it be 80%? If we hadn't put that goal in place, it might have been 10, 15%. You might have had the earlier adopters. Um, and so I'll talk in a minute about what some of those challenges are when you do that across a vast array 
of industries um, and sectors and what you start to learn when you roll up your sleeves and get into that. Um, but you, you mentioned also carbon markets. Um, I just ran over here quickly um, from another venue here at COP, which is one of the challenges if you aren't here, is how to be in three places at once when they are strategically and logistically um, near impossible to make. But that was actually a round table um, on how to scale natural capital investment. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Yes, there are carbon markets. Yes, it's an opportunity. We're specifically looking at it. Um, it's an additional emerging asset class. And so I think that there's a lot more to come in that space as well. Exciting. Well, you, you mentioned challenges. So um, sort of opening up to, to everyone on the panel here, really, you know, what is going to stop us from achieving net zero? What's the, what's the big barriers? What, what, will, what will prevent you from achieving net zero in 2040? What, what's, what's in our way? Speaking from the perspective of observing and supporting a lot of corporates, uh, now more than a thousand, um, we have been looking into the space extensively and have the luck to work with those that really mean it. But since sustainability became so popular as a topic, there's been an incredible increase in greenwashing. And I think one of the challenges that we have ahead of us is this idea that we need to uh, stop fooling ourselves that it's going to work out by nice messages and nice marketing. Uh, actual action is needed uh, because time is passing by and um, all of the discussions are just not enough for that action to turn into something uh, tangibly moving the needle on decarbonization. Um, the big opportunity that we have when it comes to greenwashing is really educating um, consumers, educating employees, educating investors so that they're able to protect their own capital. Um, we always say climate risk is financial risk and vice versa. Uh, if we actually stop fooling ourselves that uh, n nature is there to provide until uh, we decide that we don't need any more natural resources. We just don't stand a chance in addressing tangibly the challenges ahead of us. Yeah, I, I was having this conversation with some young people earlier and that you, you can't lie to nature. <laughs> you, you can do all you want with some lovely messaging and uh, some clever mathematics and statistics, but at the end of the day, nature will tell the truth. Physics tells the truth. Either emissions have increased or they haven't, or, and either sequestration has increased or it hasn't. That's, it's just physics and nature, so we can't, we can't lie about it. I, I was in a session earlier, and um, the, uh, the comment was made that, you know, carbon goes into the atmosphere, but nature is so visceral. Like, we, it's, it is, you, you, can't, you can't miss it. It's, you know, it's right there. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, and that's, that's the truth of it. We can, yeah, you can't trick nature with a marketing campaign. <laughs> um, but, uh, Julie, what about yeah, your barriers I mean, for you? I, I heard something this morning that I want to share because it really resonated with you know what we're trying to do um, as, as we scale up and and um, the encouragement and concrete support we get from our customers right so we're lucky to have microsoft and um, stripe and shopify for instance as kickstarters customers of the carbon removal market but also swiss Re, bcg right like really believing in this and 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 helping creating a full leverage for this scale to happen um, one thing that shouldn't hold us back is perfection, right? Like the, the really the search for perfection, the search for the perfect number, um, the search for the perfect solution, the search for the perfect de-risked um, you know, investment. Um, at some point we need, you know, we play with, with humanity, we play with nature, and we need to accept that and, and just go with it, right? And, and, and the more we'll be able to do that, some people will choose more tech solutions right within the portfolio that I mentioned before. Some people will choose more natural based, but for me an encouragement that I would like to give to everyone is like, go for all solution and then just dial up and down what resonates more with your business model, what resonates more with your values, what resonates with your you know, in-house capability and understanding, but every solution need, um, need a push and, and everyone working in different solution in that space would welcome, you know, any type of, of commitment and, and support. One sort of follow-up question to that, because it's, it's sort of for, for both of you really, is um, 
we've done some round tables recently with small and medium sized businesses. And one of the common uh, barriers that came up in that was uh, the funding gap where there's quite a lot of funding for innovation and pilot, piloting new things, new stuff. But the bridging funding to then, okay, we've had a successful pilot, it worked, it's great, and now what? How do we get to commercial scale? How do we bridge that gap to you know, have the first big contracts that will allow us to scale it? Has that, is that something that resonates with you? What are the sort of, in that bridging, that gap? Yeah, I mean, of course, right? I think it's, it's, it's really our ability to make sure, you know, our collective ability to make sure that we support both all the new and exciting ideas that we know we need, but also we don't lose sight of all these solutions, including the one we have today already, need to be scale up. Um, and I think that's, that's really a great, a great thing to not lose sight of. But I, I love what you said, Christina, earlier about like, how do you kind of shoot for the moon, right? Like, even if you, you need to have this like, very ambitious objective to be somewhere and put the dial up to progress. And I think you, that's very you, inspiring. You do. And I think that if, if we think back, and we were in you know, Glasgow this time last year, and I mean, my goodness, it was a watershed moment. Business showed up like never before at a COP. The commitments that were made from companies and countries, I mean, was, was phenomenal. And that was... It was absolutely needed, and it was urgent, but it was insufficient if it doesn't turn into action. And that's clearly what we are hearing. I mean, we are day two, um, but this is this has to be the action cop. I and mean, so, when you asked about you know what some of the challenges are, we have to shoot big. We have to have what happened last year. <clears throat> we have to have those targets. Are they too far out? Do, will we, over time, move those in? Probably. I will tell you, previously, I was the Chief Sustainability Officer at MasterCard, and we first um, we made our commitment to net zero, it was 2050, and we were the first in the payments industry to do so. That was great. Um, best practice is only as good as that moment, and you know, two weeks later, the 2040s came in, and we accelerated it to 2040. We're going to see, over time, those targets coming in. I think those long-term targets are needed, those bold commitments are needed, but we also need those short-term, hold us accountable targets as well. Um, and so when you ask about you know, challenges, I think we've got to start to make traction. We can't be paralyzed by perfection, um, like you had said. We're only gonna get in and start to hit those roadblocks once we start to do it. And so I'll you know, give you an example. When we've been working with our portfolio companies, um, there are, there are challenges, and the challenges are regulatory, finance, technology, data. Um, but we had our um, European portfolio companies together a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was interesting. It was the first time since COVID, and it was phenomenal to see them together trying to learn from each other. And so I think one of the best ways of us hopefully getting around some of those barriers is we've got to collectively discuss what those challenges are so that we can start to remove them. And then the last thing I'll say as far as what's going to impede us from getting there, all the things that have been discussed, but what you're also hearing so loud and clear here, especially since we're in Egypt, is it, it can't be with inequality. There's, there's the global north, there's the global south. There's a lot of conversation on that and how we do that. I think if we don't get that right, that is going to stop us from being able to do what we need to do to be able to invest in those technologies that over time will become cheaper. We will be able to do more. We've seen that happen in you know, other um, areas, but it's got to be a just transition. Couldn't agree more. Did you want to add to that, Lebo? I kept on thinking about the question you asked with regards to what is the biggest challenge for SMEs to scale up innovation. And from the observations that we've had from the Green Tech Alliance, which is this community we built a few years back where there's more than 2,000 businesses addressing different challenges related to climate change using technology, um, the biggest barrier is that there's a discrepancy on a local level between the solutions that are needed, building up on what you were saying. The Global South does not need what a place like Germany or France needs in terms of climate change solutions. 
The financing need is also different, but unfortunately the vehicles that we have access to are not n necessarily applicable uh, to the local challenges. Um, and especially to the scaling up part, even in Europe, even in the European Union, uh, where um, I spend most of my time, uh, you see so much uh, opportunity to kick off a project, but then the moment when you decide to make this into something that can move the needle within the economy, um, there's really no enough knowledgeable uh, or willing actors that will be there to support. And the final more fundamental challenge that uh, I think is applicable beyond the SMEs is really the discrepancy between standards. At the moment, with all of this push for legislation, which is absolutely welcome because, of course, it allows for businesses to see that there's serious money uh, behind this, there's serious concerns on a governmental level behind this, there is a lot of confusion in businesses. The EU taxonomy has more than 500 KPIs that you need to gather. Some of the businesses that we work with have jurisdictions uh, that they cover that have another few hundred KPIs that they need to gather because of the local uh, framework. So that really does not translate in action and there's so many studies that have been done that show that if we continue adding more reporting standards, more KPIs, we're not going to progress as fast Trying as possible. Trying to be perfect. Which, yeah. which I'll you know, jump in on that in the sense that you know, we talked about, you got to just get on with it. We, you know, we can't wait for perfection. If we're going to wait, it's, you know, it's all over. Um, but what we also can't do is get distracted in the sense that, you know, there was a global pandemic and there was, you know, I mean, incredibly unfortunate. The, we had social injustice. We had economic crisis. We have a war in Ukraine. We have an energy crisis in Europe. We have, um, the polarization and the backlash um, of ESG, you know, in the U.S. Any one of those could make you take a step back and pause, but we don't have the luxury of a pause. We have to stay the course. And so those external elements are going to continue to come. And unfortunately, we don't know what, you know, the tomorrow one looks like or the tomorrow after that or the tomorrow after that. Um, but the more we're convicted, the more we do, um, you know, there is this trust deficit. And so that is another barrier that I think that um, action, hopefully, transparency, um, you know, will help us in that sense. Yeah, no, I think that's very true. And maybe, you know, to come back to a bit of more short-term perspective to your question, right? If I'm a small, medium enterprise, how do I take action or how do I get to scale my solution? You know, we get that question often at Climeworks, right? A couple of months ago, we raised uh, one of the largest, you know, amount of money in, in clean tech. Um, 650 million to build infrastructure that, that delivers the, the services and, and, the, and the, um, the impact we want to make. Um, I think there are two things, you know, that are very um, strongly, you know, strong arguments for Climax. The first one is get to action and take that first step, right? So we say the power of small steps, you know, build that pilot plant, learn from it repeat, right? A couple of weeks ago, we announced that we'll focus on our second generation technology. That's the, the one we have now in, in Iceland. The one previously we had implemented it in Switzerland, you know, has served its most purposes of, of learning around. So really take that first step and make it concrete. And the second one is kind of the quality, right? And the level of scrutiny and the standard that you set for yourself, like really saying, okay, this is my plan and this is what I want to deliver and this is what I deliver against. Doesn't matter really the scale of the step, but at the trust that you build into customers, investors, supporters, right? That will then, you know, help create that, that, that tailwind for, for the scale up is really important. I got quite inspired by what you were saying, uh, and, and I feel like we all listed now and gave everyone a good framework of all the things we can complain about <laughs> and that need to be act actually taken care of from a legislative business, but also individual perspective. What I believe we often forget, and that's to do with the fact that the climate change narrative is obviously, for obvious reasons as well, quite negative. We're not using this global challenge as an the first and maybe biggest opportunity in decades for us to unite. Um, there's... <laughs> yes. <Love> that. <laughs> so there's an applause just... from the back there if you didn't hear that on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's so much work to be done and it could feel quite overwhelming, but each one of us as individuals, as business people, come in with a different skill set, with a different background, with a different knowledge, 
you know how to do removal, I know how to do decarbonization, you know how to move money where they have to go. And when you put all of these different perspectives together, you all of a sudden start seeing that the puzzle pieces are there, they just need to be connected. Um, we need to move away from this negativity. Climate change is something that needs to be normalized. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. And it's not going anywhere because we're not taking enough action, but it's also not going anywhere because it's been um, possible for us for decades to act on it. We have not. Now we need to organize ourselves and work together to transform society and also our economy to a more sustainable model. We don't together, have another right? option. We don't have another option. The other option is humanity to disappear. But so very quickly, I just wanted to, we'll move on to opportunities, I think, now, and, and, okay. and uh, have a think about sort of what, it, what excites you, yeah. right? And, and uh, you know, what, what, a bit of a vision. In 2030, where do you see us and, and what excites you? But very briefly, on the standards front and the uniting thing, I wanted to very quickly reference something that's coming out on Friday. Uh, it's being launched officially Friday evening, which is the ISO Net Zero Guiding Principles. And the, the idea behind the ISO Net Zero Guiding Principles is everyone has been involved in them. Science-based targets initiative, um, sort of very, I mean, I, went, I was on a number of the different workshops and the, every call would have 120 people on it going through, going through it like a, COP 20, like a COP document. It was remarkable to be a part of. But that's being launched on Friday. And the idea behind that is to try and just strip out some of this complexity about all these different things saying different frameworks saying different things and make this sort of one guiding principles it's not a standard that people will <coughs> align to it's much more actually for the governance organizations and the standards bodies to go right here's the here's the baseline that we're all going to build upon so i'm hopeful that that's going to be something that will really help unite the language the definitions the 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 minimum expectations that come with what does a good net zero target and action plan look like so Hopefully that will be something which helps. So look out for that coming out on Friday. Um, and I know that it was, uh, and an, a, a separate initiative was announced yesterday here, which was the um, Banking Alliance for Net Zero. And a number of parties are, have identified small and medium sized businesses having challenges within Net Zero. And so they're gonna be working on a framework for Net Zero over the coming year that is more geared towards SMEs, which would be quite exciting. The UK task force. Uh, for There's the transition plan task yeah. force is being announced at 5.30, so that's it kicking off. On it's announced online already, but they, the launch party is happening over there. Um, there's lots happening here in the innovation zone. If you <laughs> um, so the transition plan task force means that listed companies will have to report net zero plans by the end of 2023, and the framework for that has been launched today to say this is what a good net zero plan looks like. So that's, yeah, <laughs> applause from Alex there. Yeah. yeah. Stuff is happening, right? And this is all happening around COP. This isn't the central stuff happening at COP. COP gets used as a, as a platform to bring a lot of things to fruition. So that's one of the things that excites me is that there's, there's a lot of these different things that are going to cascade through because sustainability is different than any other type of international cooperation in that because of scope three emissions, anything that gets placed on a large corporate trickles straight down through the supply chain to small and medium-sized businesses as well which often isn't fully appreciated. So unlike things like modern slavery, where the reporting kind of gets to the large businesses and sort of stops, because of scope three, it cascades straight down. Um, so I'm excited by how much of a game changer that will be and how some of these things that are coming in around COP will make a difference. But what are you guys excited about? What's 2030, what's the vision? What, what, are, you, what are the biggest opportunities that we have? Okay, first of all, I'm so glad we got to the exciting part. Um, and thank you, for, thank you for shifting us to that. Um, Julie and I were talking right before uh, we started, and she said, why did you make the move to asset management? And I mean, I literally, I mean, I physically get, um, you, you can tell when I answer this how passionate I am about it. I said, I cannot think of a better place to be right now in sustainability than to be able to play a role in allocating capital. Um, we talk about this of the greatest crisis of our time, and guess what? It's also the greatest growth opportunity of our time. Um, so it's the collaboration that we have here of just like you said, multi-sectors getting together, and that excites me tremendously. Let me tell you what also is, is really exciting. Seeing inside companies, and employees, and employees' passion 
but also what they begin to demand and require um, of who they are actually going to go work for. It's been a game changer of what you start to see. You start to see, and you know, you see it all the time in the news of company after company starting to announce that they're offering ESG and sustainability training to all of their employees. That becomes table stakes. You imagine when it's not just this group on the side um, that is driving sustainability. Um, you now have it, you know, reporting to the CEO and sitting on executive committees and entire employee workforces um, having the skill set which you were talking about. That's a challenge right now because they don't have the muscle and we're building that up. All of that, to me, um, you know, we talk about, you know, the regulations, we talk about the standards, we talk about the technology needed, we talk about, you know, the partnerships, but we can't forget the human capital piece in this. And I think that the human capital element is going to help us leapfrog and scale. And to me, that's going to be an exciting place to watch. I mean, I'm passionate about sustainability, but developing talent and shaping culture. And so to me, it is just such a sweet spot right now. I'm going to start again with a problem. <laughs> um, so we have a problem with the framework of assessing the value of our economy. At the moment, the KPIs that define success are related to margins, profits, but as much as this could be valid, uh, it only would be if we would to add the KPIs associated to the externalities um, related to the products that we use, the natural resources that we extract, the healthcare that needs to be paid for when there's pollution. And what excites me, and now I get to the good bit, is that from all the companies that we work with and those that come to us wanting to kick off their journey, you explain to them what this transition to a more sustainable economy means and they all of a sudden start understanding that if they get this right now, they will be winning the economy of tomorrow. And they're gonna be making so much more money and they're gonna be pioneering because ultimately what businesses need to understand and many do uh, from today's perspective in comparison to even last year is that there is no way for you to be successful in the next five to 10 years if you don't have a clearly defined sustainable value proposition. It's not even anymore about an agenda or a nice slogan or a story to tell. It really is about knowing how to create longevity within your business model um, and also flexibility that is able to allow for resistance when these kinds of crises that now we're gonna be seeing a lot more often get to occur. I am so amazed by the leadership that I've seen in the companies that we work with. And I know how difficult it is for them because deciding to go on this path, it's not something that happens overnight. If you've been explained for decades that a business is only driven by profits and that's only going to be the way for you to make uh, a successful case, now that you need to find out that profits actually are at stake because of climate risk, you all of a sudden need to rethink go back to a white canvas and kick off a fundamental shift within your business. They're doing it beautifully and I think we're only in the beginning of this transformation. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things I quite like to come back to is that you know businesses make money by solving problems and you name a bigger potential problem than the risk of human extinction. <laughs> it's just, yeah, there's I, a lot of opportunity here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, you know, just as a wrap up to that, I think what excites me very personally is when you expand that, beyond the business, right? And if everyone confronted to that challenge, you know, can not only collectively, but also individually understand the contribution that, that one can make is really truly empowering because at every level, you know, in your life, in your work, in your family, in your network, you can bring something that goes into the right direction and then you get this kind of compound effect, right? And I think if you do that with the biggest challenge of the time, then you can do it with anything. The upcoming challenges, you know, anything you can, up, you know, you can be confronted with personally. And I think there's this mix of collaboration, but also engagement and empowerment that everyone can feel out of this is, is, really, um, is really powerful. Amazing, right. Well, I wanna give the audience a bit of a chance to get involved if possible. Um, so if you, if you raise your hand, I don't know if there's a microphone out there if I want to... There is a microphone. Amazing. So yes, hands up yes. if you'd like to ask a question to our wonderful panel. Hi. Uh, thank you guys so much for the panel. Uh, my question is specifically about software um, and the generally the type of technology that we need for the transition moving forward. And um, I work in a VC that focuses on emerging markets. 
And given that, especially that the scope is in Africa, and a lot of, uh, if we look at the forefront of the breakthrough technology, a lot of it's happening in, in the global north. I'm wondering from your perspective, especially from the perspective of planning and climate works, do you see much of the um, breakthrough innovations coming from emerging markets moving forward? Or do you think a lot of it's going to be the innovations happening in some countries and then it's coming down north? It's a bit of a specific question, but I was curious to see uh, what are your thoughts on that? Fantastic question, and I think it's incredibly important because there's actually discrimination in software as well. Uh, so uh, the way we've approached it is to make sure that we avoid it at any cost. So how the planning software works is we have a um, platform that kicks off with science when it comes to the development itself. We follow the international frameworks, which immediately eliminates some of these discrimination uh, opportunities and focuses specifically on the scope three elements. And when you work with a large fashion company or automotive or even financial institution, it always ends up being connected to this global village that we live on, uh, where money uh, flowing, be it because some of the suppliers are sitting in uh, one place versus another, uh, and therefore need to submit data for the full picture to be uh, painted, or because uh, there's some projects that are being developed uh, to create social impact. Um, so kind of from that perspective, uh, where I think software can play a big part is, um, using these international frameworks, you can create a lot of transparency on what are the biggest levers for improvement. And the truth is, is that in 90% of the cases, when you look at a business that is exposed to um, Asia, Africa, Latin America, this is also where the most amount of investment needs to be made so that infrastructure is improved, so that it's more resilient to climate change, so that also the local communities are empowered rather than at the negative side, on the receiving side of negative implications of climate change or the impact that maybe a facility that is putting toxins in the water uh, is making, just thinking about fashion again. Um, what this transparency also allows is uh, kind of universal communication that can really not be faked. Uh, the businesses that want to go in scope three and use primary data, so that's where you don't use proxies and averages, actually get uh, quite quickly to the realization that uh, there's no way out of them um, masking the negative impacts that they have in a particular geography. And uh, as much as maybe it might seem a bit nascent as a space, uh, I'm really encouraged by the progress that I see from all the uh, kind of half of our clients uh, work with an exposure to Asia, Africa, or Latin America. And, uh, they are putting the money into the improvements that they can do. Um, as a final step, this uh, all comes at the cost, and I know I said it, but I cannot stress it enough because this is the biggest impediment to climate action, it's education. Because um, I always use this anecdote, it's something that really has uh, defined my own uh, journey as a founder, is the story of how Costa Rica was able to become the sustainability pioneer. 15 years ago, Costa Rica decided on a governmental level that they were going to support their farmers on transitioning to a regenerative model. What this meant for them, though, uh, was that they had to make this initial investment that was not going to bring returns overnight. Um, within uh, 10 years, they spent all of their money in educating the farmers on the value of working on regenerative models that within a short amount of time are able to produce more, that you're able to actually use the land better. Um, and at the moment, we see them topping up any sustainability statistic. This kind of an example applies to a company, it applies to a venture capital fund, to any. If someone decides to pioneer now, they actually are going to be there uh, looking like Costa Rica from their own uh, context. Be like Costa Rica. I <laughs> love that. Um, and. Yeah, I think one of the, I had a conversation with someone from the Seychelles earlier, and the other thing that doesn't, we need to be very careful about in thinking of sort of exporting softwares or solutions in particular to other parts of the world, is that the solutions to challenges are different as well. What is an unavoidable residual emission in a small island nation is very different to what it is in mainland Europe, because if you know, there's only so much that you can create a local supply chain on a very small island. You can't, there's a certain amount of importing of medicines and other things that is, you can't get your own local national supply chain for that. And so, um, sh you know, she sort of shared with me that 
they'd had a recommendations report done by a company that was uh, in Europe, and she was like, well, a whole bunch of these things are just, they don't apply to us. We can't do that. that is, your recommendation is impossible for us. And so we have to be very careful in thinking and make sure we're working with local people who understand the local challenges and can develop local solutions. Um, because it, you know, this thing is geographically bound as well as people bound, culture bound. And that's, we often talk at Planet Mark about how do we move from carbon to culture? How do we get it embedded in, with the employees, embedded with the suppliers, embedded with the people who make up these organizations, governments, and, and, and entities? But um, what about, is there anything else, anyone else want to come back to that? Or do we want another question from the audience? We've got a question here. Hello, uh, thank you very much for all the panel's um, dedication and also your time commitment on uh, the decarbonization journey. Uh, my name is Angeline Huang and from New York. So uh, today my question for Christina, uh, I working, uh, I also have a launch the Alliance for Impact, similar mission, and uh, I working with a lot of investment, sustainable impact investment fund manager, and I understand from their uh, frustration or confliction is uh, they also need to meet the client investment uh, fiduciary uh, responsibility. If you apply the sustainable technology or strategy, they might lower the return. But in the sense, on the other hand, uh, as a chief uh, sustainable uh, officer, um, you also have this responsibility that you need to commit the future long term. So the short term and long term, and how do you, uh, you know, resolve this kind of conflict when you make the decision for your company? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, and I think that we 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 have to look at all of our stakeholders. And so you're absolutely right. We do have a fiduciary duty, you know, to our clients, um, and and so they're a stakeholder. Um, governments and regulators are also a stakeholder to have the strategic freedom to do um, what we set out to do as a business. Uh, employees are also a stakeholder and communities are also a stakeholder in order, in order to have the social license to operate. And so I think that you know, we do have to, to look across all of those. Um, for us, we have a private market side, which I, which I talked about. We also have a public investments um, side. And so um, that's where we're able to work through influencing, through proxy voting and engagement, which you had mentioned earlier, um, in order to help um, our, uh, the, the, the companies in which we invest in to, um, to move forward on their commitments on that side. Um, and on the private market side, what we have the opportunity to do is actually place um, our Macquarie employees on the boards of our portfolio companies so that we can start to help build um, from an executive committee, from a board level, um, the tools and the technology and the governance and the processes in place um, to help them as well. And so I think it's the holistic stakeholders, um, but absolutely have the fiduciary duty. Um, but it's also based upon, um, you know, the the mission and the vision of you know the company and and living that truly. Okay, so I think we've got time for maybe one more question. This gentleman here. Hi, my name is Ayla David, and I'm from Tanzania. I'm working with uh, an organization on a sustainable ocean alliance. We are looking to protect and restore blue carbon ecosystems like mangroves and seagrass. Um, and currently, we are working to restore 500 hectares of mangroves. So my question is, from the very wonderful panel discussions that I've had, is, for instance, my, from my experience working from in low coastal communities in restoring mangroves and seagrass in our in our communities, there are a lot of things, a lot of resources that we are lacking, like technology, and the financing and everything. So I was asking if we can create an ecosystem where uh, the Global South community who are working on the ground can access partnership and work together with different companies 
and different places. For instance, in my case, I've been trying to develop these 500 hectares of mangrove for a one year now. So I had to go to the government and get the permits and everything. And then it comes to the issue of technology in mapping the site, the area that I'm working with. The technology was not that available, so I had to access coordinates and try to map it with drones. But there are satellite people who uh, have the, the technology somewhere. We could sit down and work together and also different companies to access the carbon credits to actually uh, benefit the local coastal communities who are trying to depend on that area and they live on that and they depend on their for their livelihood to see for them for them to see the change and for them to uh, actually fight the, against the climate change. So what I'm asking is that how can we bring uh, different people together and actually make the local coastal communities aware in developing countries, aware of the resources and who to play with, who to work with. And even for now, I'm still working on standardizing the amount of carbon that we, we capture from the project. So you, the thing is also crazy, like where to get the standardization. And also we find cases like you have to pay for the process to get a, a certification for your project, you see, and you are still trying to find uh, resources to support the projects, the low cost of emissions and everything. So I'm asking how this ecosystem is really open, accountable, and trying to help the Global South communities like ours to actually really push and work on it. Thank you. Such a fantastic question. Who would like to... So there's an organization called Open Earth Foundation that I would highly recommend you check out. What they're doing at the moment is developing um, essentially alternative currency that would fit within the standards of central banks uh, to essentially give value to nature, but not necessarily in the context of nature-based capital, but really put nature as part of the assets that we have on this planet. Uh, the founder of this organization is someone I, I get the chance to work with really closely, Martin Weinstein. Uh, he's on the science board of Plan A, and uh, as he always says, uh, actually the global south is a lot richer than the global north, but the problem is that we have the wrong mathematics. Uh, so what they're trying to achieve with this uh, framework is really allowing for these kinds of projects like yours to benefit from technology, including uh, actually mapping of land, because uh, they have a lot of different stakeholders uh, involved in this with different types of technology, putting all of this on blockchain, which, yes, <laughs> had, I, blockchain had to be named uh, as a, when we're talking about technology, uh, and essentially make it in a decentralized way uh, assessed in terms of value. Uh, we can speak uh, additionally to that, but they are hosting actually extensive amount of sessions at the UNFCCC stand in the Blue Zone, um, and more than happy to introduce you to him uh, so you discuss how this can go further. Uh, anyone else want to? Yeah, m maybe, you know, just one thing, building on what we discussed before around, like, engagement at a different level, I would really encourage, I find the climate's best to be very, very collaborative. I mean, of course, we need to do more, but if we talk about the opportunity and the positive side of things, so I would really encourage to map out who are the people that have a connection to the kind of the same value and the same skills and competencies you have, and just hold them accountable to the mission. Not everything is about you know giving money or giving you know um, giving giving assets, but it can also be giving time, giving contacts, making those connections with knowledge um, sharing. And I think you know I think that's that's really part of the journey we on together. So don't be shy and and just connect with the different people. I think that that will be uh, very valuable. Amazing. So I think we're, we're sort of out of time. So just to, I guess, briefly summarize some of the things we've heard here today. Um, getting, just get started and short-term goals with accountability uh, that, that allow us to make genuine traction. Just get started. Uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good. Um, and then we need to scale those successful solutions. It's, it's very easy to chase after the next sparkly thing, the next sparkly thing. Actually, if something's working, let's work on scaling. Let's get it up and out there. We talked about the fact that inclusion is key, including employees in the process, including wider stakeholders and communities in the process, and local people, wherever it is in the world. Uh, inclusion and diversity is, is absolutely critical. Otherwise, we are just not going to manage it. Um, collaboration. Uh, is, is queen, I'm going to say, because let's get rid of this collaboration is king nonsense. This is a panel of queens, so it's, collaboration is queen. 
Um, and uh, and bringing it round home is that there's a, there's the, the problem that Lubomila led with around saying there's a problem with how we define a successful economy, and we need to move that needle towards what does success look like around the world? What does a successful economy look like uh, that will allow us to unlock? That, that shift, that move where we can move from these things where we measure carbon to really embedding a, a culture of sustainability that is lasting and, and restorative and, and regenerates our planet. So I think we'll round off with that. And thank you, everyone, for coming along and the thank fantastic you. questions. Thank you. Thank you.